stop by. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, every man, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, we thank God tonight for another Is it reconnect? It's trying to reconnect. That's what it says. Trying to reconnect. Reconnect the Lord for another brightly divided word of truth Bible study. We thank God for his grace, his mercy, his truth. Man, we've not gone live on Facebook in a long time, uh, but we tonight we thank God for the opportunity to come uh, here on Facebook. Would you uh, go ahead and share the video if you want to share the word of God with everybody. And man, we have a good word, I believe, tonight from the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> it's good uh, that we've gotten through this Thanksgiving season, and man, I thank God for all have mercies. He extended to all of us. Amen. He brought us here tonight. Another opportunity to worship, magnify his name through his word. Uh, and of course, you know, the word of God is the most important thing in our lives. The word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And thank God tonight, today, we're celebrating the 11th birthday of Sister Kamira. Thank God, Sister Kamira Amen. turned 11 Amen. years old today. Amen. We thank God for these children. Thank God for, uh, again, rightly divided word of truth Bible study here at True Cornerstone Church, uh, 2516 Halls Mill Road, Mobile, Alabama, 36606. Uh, feel free to come visit us anytime during our service times. Amen. And just for your information, you can uh, you can get on our texting list. Amen. It's by if you if you go to you see here, hope you can see it. You, you dial, uh, you, you text 57711, and to that number, you text the word Cornerstone, all capital letters, Cornerstone, 57711. Text the word Cornerstone to be included in our uh, mailing, in our email uh, list. Tech, I'm sorry, text messaging, Lord have mercy, text messaging list, and so uh, it's good to, uh, to have, did it go out again? Yeah. I can't Just talk, the way. Hmm? Yeah, you cannot. All right, put that on. And tonight we're going to be going to the book, beginning with the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, uh, verse number 19. And tonight's subject is faith in prayer, but not in God. Faith in prayer, but not in God. Amen. We uh, uh, are going, we're in a season uh, where this is probably the highest level of stress that people experience throughout the year for the most part uh, because we're embarking uh, on the Christmas season, well, we're in the Christmas season, and then the new year and people, uh, there are a lot of different things that happen within these what one and a half, two month span, a lot of things happen. Uh, people go through a lot of things and uh, people tend to uh, need more help and, and uh, will many, in many instances will begin to seek God for more help. Uh, but we are caught up in seeking God for results and not seeking God because he is God. And so uh, then we find ourselves uh, frustrated and, and disappointed and angry and in trouble. Uh, but the Word of God has a diagnosis and a remedy. Uh, in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 18, verse number 19, Now therefore, uh, send the gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now, this is happening as a result of the prophets uh, who were under Ahab, of course he was the most evil king of Israel, and the prophets of Baal, uh, the, the prophets of the grove, and they were challenging Elijah, the man of God. And so there's something you need to understand from the outset is that everyone has faith in something or someone, including all of us. Our faith 
is in something or in someone. Unfortunately, most often, our faith is not in God, but it's in God's uh, in God's uh, doing things for us. And so we want God to give us stuff, and so we then exercise uh, faith. But the problem is, the faith that we're exercising is not necessarily faith in God, but it is faith in receiving what we are asking for. It is faith in uh, uh, things that come into fruition uh, that we're desiring in our lives. And so we find ourselves then in precarious situations because when the things that we long for do not happen for us, they don't come to pass, when it doesn't work out the way we think it ought to work out, then uh, we are, our faith is tested and we are not as strong in our faith because our faith is results oriented as opposed to simply having faith in God. And because we don't have faith in God, we struggle unnecessarily and find our faith failing us uh, because our faith is not in God. And uh, before I read further, we just know we, we'll take the words of Jesus himself uh, in, uh, in, in speaking with the disciples and while he walked the earth. And Jesus simply said to the disciples in Mark 11 and 22, and Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. Now, if he's indicating for them to have faith in God, then it, it seems to me that it's possible to have faith outside of God. And your faith is going to work for you, but it can also work against you working uh, because you believe in something happening. Often say when people get up in the morning and say, Lord, it's a, already a bad day, that they, their faith will deliver unto them a bad day. That is faith in what you speak. Uh, and so here in First Kings, uh, a very early example of people having faith in their God. And, and when you do, some things happen, some things don't. But faith in God, the, the, the father Abraham, the, God, the father Isaac, the father Jacob, and man, we know his, his name today is Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ will always work for you. Now therefore ascend and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, unto, and said How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. And so he's given this wisdom to the people. Look. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal be God, you follow him. Now, one thing I always love about God, God's not, he's not, he doesn't force us. He gives you a choice. You can follow whoever you want to follow. The problem is be careful who you follow because you're not going to get the results that you think you're going to receive uh, uh, for simple fact that matters that God is God all by himself. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So he is outnumbered, 450 of them, one of them. Uh, and, 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 and then you have the 400 uh, prophets of the groves. And so he was, it was 850 uh, versus one man. But what the word tells one can chase a thousand, two can put 10,000 to flight. And so Elijah just tell him, it's just me and it's all of them. Verse 23, uh, 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 verse 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. So we're going to start up on the same level, same conditions. No difference. Uh, you can choose the bullock. That's fine. You can set it all up. And we're just going to do the same thing. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now, there's one thing about it. So many people don't have faith in God. 
Their faith is in everything and everyone but in God. And so they find themselves in frustrated. And don't you get in the business of arguing with them and challenging them and worry yourself about that because you cannot make anyone have faith in God. But God will demonstrate himself to all of us. That is what God does. God shows himself mighty and he shows himself strong. That is what God does. You don't have to make the case for God. He makes the case for himself. And too often, uh, folks get bogged down in fights and arguments and all of those things uh, uh, with folks. And, and you don't have to. You don't have to argue about God. You don't have to argue about Christianity, about your faith in Jesus, about Jesus is God. No arguments. There is no argument, no conflict you have to be comfortably saved and comfortably walking in faith, knowing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. And so Elijah puts the challenge out there. You pray to your gods. Now you pray to your gods and I pray to my God uh, because you're going to need a whole lot more than one to do what my, my, one, one God does because they can't do anything. But they, that was according to their own personal knowledge and call you on the name of your gods and I will call the name of the Lord and the God that answered by fire let him be God and all the people answered and said it is well spoken and Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal and this is again first Kings 18 and verse number 25 and Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first for ye are many and call on the name of your gods but put no fire under and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even unto noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. For there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Now, understand, these prophets are praying, expecting Baal to deliver. They're expecting Baal to answer their prayer. O Baal, hear us. The challenge is for Baal to send down fire from heaven to consume the bullock on the altar. That's the challenge. And these men are believing that Baal is going to do what they ask him to do. Their faith is in Baal. Their faith is in Baal. All of us, our faith is in something or someone. All of us, none of us excluded. You're going to, your faith is in something or in someone. None of us excluded. And so their faith is in Baal. And they called, and, 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 but no voice answered. They leaped upon the altar, which was made, verse 27, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God, either he is, for he is a God, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. And so he knows that they are being absolutely ridiculous, and unfortunately they don't know that. Uh, but he's he's mocking them. Now all y'all doing, your God, you're 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 praying to him. Your God, you're crying out to he must be sleeping because he is not answering you. Uh -huh. Now, there's nothing again he could convince them. Or he couldn't change their minds because their faith was in their God. When people put their faith in their God, you cannot allow them to frustrate you because they do not want to put their faith in Jesus Christ. But if you wait on time, Jesus will prove himself to all of us. And not just in when he returns for the church, but I'm talking about in today. Man, so often we convolute it because we over-talk it and we try to make folks, you can't bully people into believing in Jesus. You can't make folks believe uh, the way you believe. You have to make sure that you believe the way you believe. Amen. You have to know that you believe the word of God because the word of God is true all by itself, whether you believe it or not. But so it just is a waste of time not believing in the word of God. The easiest, the simplest, the best thing to do is simply believe in the word of God. And so Jesus is God. Have faith in him and watch life 
take on a more positive uh, 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 perspective in uh, your daily living. Uh, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Now, don't think it's strange that they are, they're doing what they're doing. Many of us today in our churches, we do the same thing. And we do it differently. You don't cut yourself, but by the time you try to go through all these antics and all these performances in church to prove that you are just so God's going to do it. And we go through all these things today. We do what we call prayer lines or prophecy lines. Everybody's standing up and, and folks want to, want the preacher to give their, tell their fortune. Everybody's, everybody's hungry and thirsty for a word, but not to hear from God. Even though people say in church things like this, just tell me the truth. You don't want the truth. When you tell folks the truth, folks cop an attitude. You don't want the truth. Well, I just love, I just, I don't just give it to me raw. You don't want it raw. You don't want it at all, but you don't want it straight. Uh, and so we have folks who come with all kinds of, of ideas of, of what they think they want, what they think they like, what they think they believe in, but not for real, though. And so what happens is that folks become frustrated. They become frustrated because what they need to be happening is not happening, and their faith is in it happening, and but not in God. And so when, the, when your faith is in things happening that you want to happen, but your faith is not in God, then you walk away frustrated because you have not demonstrated faith in God. But when you have faith in God, then you stop walking around so frustrated. Uh, things don't happen the way you think they should happen, but that doesn't shake your faith because I'm not caught up in results. I'm caught up in the fact that God is, is almighty and he can do anything but fail. And so my faith is in him, which means that I know his desire for me will never fail me. It can never hurt me. He will never work against me. And so unlike these prophets here, they started cutting themselves and, and abusing themselves, using knives and lances, and the blood started gushing out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded all that they did. Now, I'll tell you all again, don't just look at this. Read this and think, oh, that was then. No, this is today. This is what's happening in today's church. People going, people doing uh, a lot of extra things. Uh, and, and all the extra folks are doing and nothing's changing. Now, think about it. Today, we, they, we work it like this, or they do. They prophesied that it was going to happen. God told me in three days. But then four days, five days, six days, seven days, four months, six years, and none of it they prophesied came to pass. But you're still looking for it to come to pass because you have faith in the person who spoke to you. Why? Because you were lusting after something that you needed rather than lusting after Christ. If you lust after Christ, then you will never walk in spiritual frustration. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. All the carrying on folks doing in church. All this carrying on folks going to conferences and all this stuff and all these grandiose uh, 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 expressions and and, and they're impressive in their delivery, but there is no godly evidence. And because there is no godly evidence, there is no change in your situation. Now, now the devil will do you this favor. He'll convince you that he blessed you because they prophesied you're going to get a new, a, new, a, a new car, right? Now, you know anybody can get a car. So you keep going to enough lots to know somebody's going to give you a car. So you're going to get that car, but then you went and got you a 25% loan and come back to church all happy with your keys up to my God bless me with this car. No, the devil just burdened you with the bill that you can't afford to pay. And not many days hence, that car is going bye-bye. Baby, you cut yourself, you're carrying on, you're doing too much. 
and your God is not answering. So what do you have to do is answer yourself. And so you go and start trying to make things happen. Now remember now, because you know James writes, uh, James says, "Now uh, faith without works is dead." And because I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach on that tonight. But because that scripture is 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 hardly ever rightly divided. The most, in fact, it's never rightly divided. People are moved to start doing things, pulling uh, pulling strings and, and 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 all these kinds of things to make things happen. Because child, you just can't go by faith. You got to make it happen. He said, "Faith is not works." So you go to work. You start working to try to get what you you said you believe God to receive. Now, if you work for it, then it's not of faith. And because the scripture is not rightly divided, and the scripture is not talking about you uh, working to demonstrate your faith by, by, by going out to work, what, what James is talking about is, look, you can't tell folks uh, to have faith in God, but then you have the ability to bless them, and you don't. Now you are preaching faith, but your faith is void of works. So don't tell someone else to have faith in God they will receive. No. What James is talking about, faith in God, you demonstrate it by what you do, what you give, what, what, what you bless them with, and that's faith. So now you can say now, faith without works is dead. So don't tell me about, oh, God's going to give you something to eat, and you're eating in my face. I want to hear that. No. You have not shown me works, so you've done nothing but messing up my faith. But when you give me a little something to eat, then you tell me, you know, God will provide your needs. He'll feed you when you're hungry. Well, guess what? You just proved that to me. So now, faith with works is a lie. But without the works, without you demonstrating something, that's dead. But I'm not going to, that, that's a whole nother Bible study. Uh, but everybody believes in something. And, and most often in church, our faith is in man and not in God. That's why people talk about church hurt. Always hurt in the church. Because your faith is not in God, but it is in man. When things don't happen as you think they should happen, then your faith is tested. And now you are angry because your faith is not in God, but it is in man or is in some other God other than in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, and Elijah said, uh, verse 30, Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him and, repair, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now, Elijah's going to prove to them that, you know, you called on your God, and guess what? All that y'all, all that carrying on y'all did, and it didn't work, right? So now, go ahead and repair the altar. Let me start where you started. But in fact, let me make it worse than it, than it was for you. And so he builds the trench. And the trench could, uh, could contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullet in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, they didn't do that. All they had was the, set, what was the altar and the sacrifice. And he said, Do it the second time. And he did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And he did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So let's remember this now. The prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove, they were operating by faith. They had faith in their God, and they called on Baal. They believed Baal was going to do it. Baal didn't answer. They started cutting themselves and acting a fool, and guess who still didn't answer? Baal didn't answer. But guess what they were? They were in pain. Too many folks today in churches are in pain because your faith is not in God. Your faith is in your church. Your faith is in the order of the service. So your faith is in at some point they're going to make an altar call. At some point they're going to sling oil all over me. They're going to, somebody's going to stand me up and prophesy to me. Your faith is in all of that, but your faith is not in God. God. And so you, you leave frustrated, you leave broken. You you dug in your pockets because somebody told you this is a $500 line, a $1,000 line, a $100 line. If you give this, God's going to do this and do that for you. And you've been given a long time and nothing's changed. Nothing's gotten better for you. And so you're still cutting on yourself. You're still going through all of these steps trying to prove that you have faith. Unfortunately, all you're trying to prove is that you have faith. 
but you're not trying to prove you have faith in God. Faith in prayer, but not in God. Faith in prayer, but not in God. Folks love, oh, I pray all day, but are you praying with faith in God? I pray our first thing in the morning. We say things like this, and I'm, I'm just, you know, just I'm not trying to uh, 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 step on anybody's toes, but we say things like this. Oh, God really hears you when you pray early in the morning. Something about that 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock prayer. Now, do you think God's hearing changes any time of day? God is not a man. Do you think God is hearing impaired ever? Absolutely not. The things that we come away with in church, now, what it boils down to is that we become idolaters and don't understand it. And so there are things where we, we become mythological, uh, uh, and, and sometimes it borders on witchcraft, not because we are intentionally practicing these things, but there are many things that we do through ignorance. Hear me, O oh Lord, hear me, that this people, I'm sorry, let's go back to verse number 35. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. So what, what does God do? God shows up mightily. Why? Because Elijah's faith was in God. When your faith is in God, God shows up for you. Again, your faith cannot be in somebody laying hands on you or a specific one laying hands on you. Well, if my past doesn't, doesn't pray for me, then I ain't been prayed for. Um, so who's your faith in? So what happens if your, if your past is not available, your pastor's dead, your pastor's sick, then who's going to pray for you? And so your faith is in your pastor, but not in God. And so you walk around frustrated. Your faith is in how you think you ought to pray. So you walk around frustrated because you have a formal prayer in which you engage and you have so much faith in your in your, your prayer structure. You have faith in it because it makes sense to you. That's fine. But you're impressed with your praying and not impressed with faith in God. And so it's amazing how so many people uh, stay in church and are in church for many, many years and, and decades and, and still never develop a sense of faith in God. Now, again, Ahab's, Ahab's prophets and uh, the, who were the prophets of, of Baal and the prophets of the grove, uh, they had faith. They had faith in their God. They believed their God was going to do what they asked him to do, send down the fire and consume their sacrifice, send down the fire. They believed, and they, 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 they didn't go on for 20 minutes. They went all, all morning long. They went a long time calling on their God, so they were cutting themselves and all that stuff, and, and the man of God started mocking them. What happened? You, you, your God sleeping? <laughs> What's going on, man? <laughs> all that y'all doing? They, but they still had faith in their God. They kept praying. They kept whatever they were doing. They were cutting the food. But nothing happened. But then the man of God, when, when, when Elijah prayed, he didn't have to go through all of these uh, 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 techniques. And he didn't have to cut himself and run around and jump and hop on screaming. And, and this is how so many of us in today's church, we pretty much operate the same way. Where we think that prayer is how physically intense we can approach God. <gasps> oh, gee, nothing wrong with it. It's good. Because sometimes, you know, when it gets real good to you, you lose yourself and, you know, that, that, that's okay. But you're not doing that to try to make God, to impress God. That's, that's birthing your own feeling. That's the intensity of your worship. That's fine. But, but too often people think that we're going to move God because we, we start getting some quickening and shaking and all this stuff and start sweating and, and going crazy and running and, and jumping and howling and screaming. And, and, and they did that. 
They did that in 1 Kings. They did that. But the problem is their faith wasn't in God. They didn't do all that talking to God. They, they didn't talk to their God. And so they were still frustrated. Well, how many of us come to church and we do all of that and we still leave depressed? Can you imagine all of, all of carrying on that goes on in church and people leave and still messed up? I'm talking about, I'm talking about folks who say they're saved. How are you saved? You come to church, do all the acting out. I know the Lord heard me tonight. But then you leave and you're, you're messed up when you leave as you before you came. Because you didn't come for Jesus to do it. You came for, for what you wanted to happen to happen. But your faith was in it happening, but your faith was not in God. So because your faith is not in God, now your faith is in the results. Well, the, the one who, who answers your prayer, your sincere prayer, his name is Jesus. But your faith is not in him. Your faith is in the gift, but not in the gift there. So then you walk in frustration because you're not receiving what you think you ought to receive. We have greater faith in the gifts in the church than we do in the gifter of the church. Oh, he's a true prophet. Ooh, child. When he comes, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Well, wait a minute. Why is it that the Holy Ghost is more powerful when some man comes, but you say you feel with the gift of the Holy Ghost? If you have the Holy Ghost, then why is the Holy Ghost more powerful when some flesh and blood shows up in your presence? When God is a spirit. Because our faith is in man and not in God. Ooh, when he comes to run revival, oh, child, you know what's going to happen. What's going to happen? Was it, he's bringing a new God? He's bringing a new God. What's going on? This is, this is the, the wretched faith that we, that we demonstrate in the church. And so people become frustrated because when new folks come into the church, they're taught the same lesson. Ooh, child, the spirit was high because he ran around. No, the spirit is not an emotion. The devil comes and runs around. We watched a video uh, showing, I think I showed Callie a video on, on YouTube last night. This guy in church, he was clearly under, he was clearly influenced, under the influence of drugs. And the, the silly church folks, I'm sorry, it was you, come here. The silly church folks, uh, 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 they're getting all in a spirit. This guy is high. All the stuff he's doing, every, every, every worldly move he was doing it in the church. And the preacher wants to justify it. Sit that demon down. But folks come in, and that's what they're taught, foolishness in the church. So what happens? They come in with the same nonsense. Now, their faith their faith is in the style of worship in the church. That's why when you go to churches, so many churches where everybody worships the same way, everybody has the same mannerisms, everybody speaks the same tongue, all of this, because their faith is not in God. Their faith is in their church. And you, you get to know God not through his word, but through your church. The problem is the church is not sharing the word of God. The church, the church is sharing its style of worship what we call worship. So this is how we do it. For these five or ten minutes we do it, this is how we do it. So you come off the street and because everybody in this church go like this, when you come into church, you're going to start doing, you're going like this because you didn't come to learn Jesus and they didn't teach you Jesus. All of this has an adverse effect on your faith. So now you're not walking by faith in God. You're walking by faith, but your faith is not in God. You have faith in your church. You have faith in your preacher. You have faith in your prayer partner. You have faith in your in your prayer structure. You have faith in the time of day that you pray, but you don't have faith in God. So then you're like these prophets of Baal and these prophets of the grove in 1 Kings chapter 18. You are like them. Now you start going through all of these things. You go to praying and you're worn out when you finish praying, exhausted. But nothing's changed. But you think that you've been in prayer because you are physically exhausted. God doesn't exhaust us like that. He told us to ask and it shall be given unto us. Seek and we shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to us. He didn't say come begging. He didn't say come tripping. You have to do all of that. You just, you walk by faith. My faith is in God. I'm not worried about the result. What I'm concerned with is that when I pray, I'm praying to Jesus. 
that my faith, I believe he's going to do what's best for me. Because Jesus himself went to the cross when the flesh man went to the cross. When on the way to the cross, the flesh man spoke to the spirit. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass me. I don't really want, the flesh didn't want to die. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, that's a prayer we don't pray. God, whatever. Nevertheless, Lord, not, I'm not trying to impress anybody. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I need a new car, but if you, if you give me a used one, I'm fine. Whatever your will is for me is fine. I asked for a new. I saw that new one I liked. Lord, I want that car. And I just believe God's going to give it to me. But whatever he gives, because he knows better than I know. I know what I asked him for, but my faith is not in my asking, not in my requesting. My faith is in Jesus. Our problem is we try to convince people that we're closer to Jesus than we are by trying to prove it through things, through material possessions, through results. You can't. Lazarus was a beggar. A beggar. Had nothing. He had to be at the rich man's table. He, wanted, he just wanted some crumbs. But he died in faith. He had faith in God. <laughs> With just a bag, he didn't have any food. But no, he did. He had God. So when he died, he was found in the bosom of Abraham. And that rich man had everything. When he died in hell, he lifted up his eyes. So we have to think about these things. Because our praying defeats us. When it ought to be our victory. But it defeats us. Why? Because we have faith in prayer, but not in God. Oh, we're going to have prayer service, and that's good. We ought to have prayer service. We're going to go into prayer. That's good. Let's pray. Let's keep it going. But let's not waste God. Let's not waste our time. Uh, you can't waste God's time. Don't waste our time playing like we know you're, you're playing. Because if we come in this house of the same mind, if we enter the gates of thanksgiving, the course of praise, you don't have to conjure up the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Mm -mm. If the Holy Ghost abides on the inside, you don't have to conjure up what you possess or what possesses you. No, but in the church, we teach folks you got to come and you got to work up to it. And that was worship experience. You got all these you got to do. You got to work up. You can't just come and dance. You got to work yourself into a tizzy before you can worship. That's not, that's not biblical. That's not godly. No. No, that's like these prophets of Baal, these prophets of the grove, where they start doing all these extra things to try to prove that they God heard them. But guess who didn't hear them? That God didn't hear them. If we're going to come to church and get all sweaty, carrying on, get dirty, we need something happening for us. All that sweat not undone. I know, because I wasn't playing. My faith is in God. I was worshiping. My, my sweating, my running wasn't a begging posture. It was a thank you posture. I'm, I'm sweating because I was worse, but not because I was begging. Oh, Jesus, please, please, please what? Ask, and it shall be given. Whatever it is, whatever our condition, whatever our circumstances, be it physical, natural, health-wise, financial, whatever the case may be, we ask. You want to work all the stuff. We don't start cutting yourself and, and running in, in the walls and the poles and tripping over and carrying on and, and halfway killing yourself because if I if I act out, God going to hear me. What is he, deaf? He'll hear me better. He'll hear, he'll hear me better at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. What is he, deaf? God hears you when you call him. He hears you. Now, now the truth of the matter is that time in the morning, that time at night, Everything is calm. Everybody's calm. You're calm. And so you can you can hear him better. <laughs> he can hear you just fine all the time. But in times of tranquility and peace, you hear him better. But we mistake of talking about, oh, ain't nothing like that two or three o'clock prayer, four o'clock prayer, because God knows not. That has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you, because that's how your faith in God works for you. But when you truly walk by faith, you can have a storm going on. But your faith in God. Is what sustains you. So you know he hears you because he abides on the inside. And because you have a relationship, it does not matter. You can be in trouble. You can be wrong. But you still know that he hears you. He doesn't hear you because you're perfect. He hears you because you belong to him. Because you've been born again of water and of the spirit. So you know that he hears you. That's learning to pray. 
But again, our problem is faith and prayer, but not in God. So we're like the prophets of Baal. We're like the prophets of the grove. You're all that praying you're doing, but you're doing it to the wrong one and nothing's happening. But Elijah prayed to God and God sit down. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Sometimes we need to come to church and shut our mouths and, and fall on our faces. Don't talk so much and let God be the God of his house. It just say the Lord, he is the God. Jesus he is the God, but not us. We have to come to church and put everybody who's so mighty in Christ because we got to talk it out. I know it. I know. Shut up. Why are you talking so much? Your faith is not in your words. But unfortunately, it is. And so you talk all that talk, but you're not walking that faith walk because your faith is in your prayers. Your faith is in what you do, but your faith is not in God. And so Ahab's prophets of Baal were as committed to and no less convinced their God would answer their prayers as was Elijah to God Almighty. They believed in their God just as much as Elijah believed in God Almighty. The difference is their gods are dead. Deaf. Dumb. Responseless. Their gods the prophets of Baal took and dressed their bullock, fully believing and expecting their God to send fire, answering their prayers. Folks come to church and they pray, fully believing that what I'm asking for is going to happen. But your problem is, your mistake is you were not praying to God. You were simply praying that what you want comes to fruition, that it comes to pass, that you receive what you're asking for, but you are not praying to God. James writes in uh, James chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, James chapter 3, y'all get there, verses 14 through 18. Now, don't, don't forget about these prophets of Baal and of the grove because they had faith in their God. Now, remember that now. They had faith in their God. He was going to do it. Unfortunately, because he's a dead God, he couldn't do it. But they still had faith in their God that he was going to do it. So much so until they were willing to cut themselves. They were willing to suffer, physically suffer, to, for their God to answer them. But he was dead, so guess what? He had no answer. But, but this uh, James chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, Glory not and lie not against the truth. So one of the first things we have to overcome in our lives is to get rid of the bitterness in our hearts, to get rid of, of, of the envy uh, in our hearts, to get rid of the strife. We have to get rid of those things because when you are clogged up with those kinds of things, then you are not in a position to be in communication with God. Now understand, now listen, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, in, uh, glory not and lie not against the truth. So when you talk about envying and strife, you're talking about uh, 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 sins against spiritual sins, right? The uh, 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 works of the flesh, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Talking about the pride of life. Y'all help me out now. Talking about the pride of life. So the pride of life is a, is a serious spiritual problem. Um, it's a problem uh, that conflicts with your ability to yield to God because within yourself you imagine that you are God or something else is God other than God himself. And so he cannot then be in clear communication with you. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Don't lie against the truth. You got stuff in your heart. You got to get that stuff right first. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. 
That's why we see the limited move of God in church today because there is so much confusion in the churches. Too many cliques, too many buddies in the church and and folks, you know, when the preacher's up preaching and teaching or folks up testifying, whatever, your eyes go on you, to your group of folks and everybody looking at my crew, your crew. Uh, and so God, it's not God's house because you made it your den. And so how can he hear you when you have not dedicated your house and his house for his glory? So he can't hear you, not because he's deaf, but because you are, you rendered yourself mute. Spiritually, he can't hear you because you have too many things in your heart. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And so, problem is that you are praying, but you're praying amiss. You're not reaching God. If you go back to, uh, to chapter 4, I'm sorry, and go to verse number 1. Uh, to verse number 3, chapter 3, verses 14 to 18, where it's set up. Now, chapter 4, verse 1, from whence come wars and fighting among, fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? So when I start saying, well, I'm, it's what you did to me. So now I'm at war with you because of what you did to me, what you said to me, uh, the way you looked at me, or what you said about whatever the case may be. Then guess who's the guilty party? Well, I am. Because I've allowed evil to make me what? Evil. So now that my prayers are hindered because we're talking about, we're talking about a spiritual attack from the adversary and he begins now to cut off the communication that we we have to have with God for him to answer our prayers ye lust and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain ye fight in war yet ye have not because ye ask not all of this we're doing we're so we're so blind in this until we say things like this I'm taking back everything the devil stole from me well, that's a problem. For one, if God gave it to you and the devil stole it from you, you better check that story out. Because the devil can't take from me anything God gives me. If God gives it to me, guess whose it is? It is mine. It belongs to me. And the devil and his filthy hands can't get hold of it. Let me say it like that. All right? But now, when you start walking in churches, you start walking in the wisdom of church, then you start saying things that really contradict the word of God or they, make, they actually what they do, they reveal who and what you really are. And, and, and I don't mean because you're an evil person per se, but because oftentimes we walk in spiritual biblical ignorance. And so we start believing things that are not consistent with the word of God. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? And whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, the problem is in our spiritual walk, in our church lives, we become adulterers and adulteresses. Now, I'm not, this is not, uh, James not talking about physical adultery. Talking about spiritual adultery. Much worse than physical adultery. Spiritual adultery, you turn your heart from God. You start serving other gods. Whole nother place. And when you don't write the divided, then you think, well, I'm not an adulterer. Maybe not spiritual, not naturally, but spiritually you are. Because your faith is not in God. Your faith is in your prayer, your praying, but not in God. That makes you an adulterer. That makes you an adulteress. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Because you have greater faith in any, everything you, than you do in God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So then in the church, we take the world's systems and try to work them so that we can receive blessings 
through the world systems now, the wisdom of man, the sensuality operating in the church, the, the techniques, the antics of man operating in the church. And we wonder why we're not growing in grace and the Lord and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we're trying to use man's techniques to get ahead spiritually. Man's techniques was, will make prosper you naturally, maybe financially, but spiritually they will destroy you. Because then your faith now is found in things, in situations, but it's not in God. So many folks, <clears throat> our problem is that we come to church and we still live in something called ignorance. We pray, but we just don't know who we're praying to. <clears throat> we'll, 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 we'll proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. I love Jesus, 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 but your faith is not in him. You don't have faith in him. I know you call on his name. Even when you pray, you said in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but your faith is not in him. Your faith is in what you're doing. See, I thank God I prayed. What was that? What was that? The, the Pharisee? I thank God I'm not like that public was there, right? I'm not like other men. I pray three times a day. I fast. I do this and all that, right? Punch this chest. Look at me. And that, that sinner man was there, he would someone lift up his head. He wasn't worthy. He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sometimes we need to, the people of God need to go back to that prayer right there. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So, Lord, the sinner in me, have mercy on that man, on that woman. Well, I don't do anything wrong. No, your faith. Now, listen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, what Paul is talking about is without faith in God. People have faith in a lot of things. The, the magicians in Egypt during the time of Moses had faith in their magic. So what Moses did, they would duplicate it. They had faith that what they were doing was going to happen. They duplicated some of the miracles. They couldn't duplicate all of them. That's another Bible study. But they duplicated some of the miracles. But they, they couldn't duplicate all of them. And we got to the, when we got to the granddaddy of them all, the, the, the uh, death of the firstborn male, human or beast, right? They couldn't duplicate that. They couldn't stop that, could they? Y'all understand? But some of the other stuff, see, what happened, you come to church, and because you have some folks in church who can work some, some trickery, you think, oh, man, that's it. <clears throat> no. You forgot about the word of God. You forgot about in Acts chapter number 16, the young damsel with the spirit of divination. You forgot she was a soothsayer. She was telling people's fortunes, and she was giving them truth. You forgot that in, in Acts chapter 8 with Simon the sorcerer. You forgot he was the people that thought he was some power from God. You forgot that the woman in, in, in what second in, uh, first Samuel, the woman of Endor. You forgot about her. They could call her a witch, but the woman of Endor, she, she brought the spirit of dead prophet Samuel. How many of us can bring the spirit of, of a dead anybody? Yeah. You'll understand. So you're so impressed what your physical eyes observe, and you don't understand the spirit is operating in your presence because they jumped, how screamed, dance, and spoke in a tongue. You thought it was the presence of the Holy Ghost, but it was not because the devil has a tongue. There's something called black magic that operates in this world. You have magicians, they do things. But you don't know that. Because you are, you are more impressed with what your physical eyes observe than what your spirit man discerns. And because you don't, because the, the spirit of discernment, the gift of discernment is so uncommon in the church. I'm not talking about opinions, I'm talking about discernment. You discern the spirits operating. I know what you said and what you did. The prophecy was on point, but I discern the spirit that was prophesying. But you're impressed with what your eyes see, with what your ears hear from your source. But you try the spirits, whether they be of God, and you try the spirits by the word of God. If the spirit does not measure up to the word of God, then it is not God. It sounds good, looks good, but it's bad. It's evil. Faith and prayer, but not in God. And because we are so ignorant in the church, we come and we have, we have no idea who Jesus is. We love to call his name, 
But we have no idea who Jesus is. Remember those sons of Sceva? They knew his name, right? And they began to call his name. And the man who had them demons, uh, he started, he beat, them, beat their clothes off of them. What this? He said, Peter, of uh, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, they, they invoked the same name. Unfortunately, they didn't have the same authority. They didn't have the same intentions. So, see, when a true man of God uses the name of Jesus, it is for positive things to happen. It's not, it's not to impress anybody, not to prove to somebody, look, look how powerful Pastor Andy is. When I, when I pray, it's going to happen. When I lay hands on you, you're going to be healed. No, that's, that's, that's me promoting myself. But when you keep it in Jesus... I want you to believe that when I pray with you, Jesus is going to do what you ask him to do. And I don't have to ask you, did he do it? I don't have to ask you that. Because it's none of my business if he did it or not. My only concern is that I lead you to something, a place called faith in God. Because when I'm not near you, you're not near me. You know, we all still need to have faith in God. If I teach you faith in me, then when I'm around, I make you feel better. I make you feel confident, secure. When I'm not around, then your faith is challenged. Well, I taught you the wrong lesson. But when I teach you faith in God, it makes all the difference in the world. So we have to be mindful. Now, uh, in Acts chapter number 17, verses 22 and 23, uh, the Bible reads, Then Paul stood in the midst of Morris' hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious for as I passed by and beheld your devotions I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship ignorantly worship ignorantly worship him declare I unto you so now it's great that you have learned that you've disciplined yourself to have faith in something that you consider a higher power that's good. The problem is, too often we have not associated that faith that we have in a higher power with faith in Jesus. And so we've not, we've not effectively made Jesus that, that higher power. So we have these other things going on. I have faith I'm going to be healed. Yeah, but do you have faith in the healer? No, I have faith in the results. I have faith I'm going to get me a new house. But do you have faith in the one where the, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Do you have faith in the one that said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? No, your faith is not in him. Your faith is in your receiving something. And most of us couldn't care less who we received it from. Just so we can prove to everybody that what I said I was going to get, I got. Really? Well, folks go work hard, they get what they want. Right? And they exercise the same discipline that most folks in church do. You have faith that I want to they go work and make what they want come to fruition. They make it happen. I want a new car. I work three or four jobs to get the car I want. Killing myself, can't, can't drive it anywhere, can't live in the house that I pay a lot of money for because I got to work multiple jobs. I'm never home all at work. But they got it. But when you have faith, Lord Jesus, when you have faith in God, you don't have to worry about pulling strings and trying to make it happen. Your faith is in God. Remember now, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Your faith is in God. The instruction is seek his kingdom and his righteousness. So when folks say things like hallelujah doesn't pay bills, they don't know what the Bible says. They don't understand it. How, your hallelujah will pay your bills. Your worship will pay your bills. Your worship, your devotion to Christ will give you material things. Sure will. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? When you, when you fall in love with him and your faith is in him, God, I put my life in your hands. And I know that all things work together for good to them that love you. To them who are called according to your purpose. Well, I am them. I love you. I'm the call according to your purpose. So all things work together for good for me because I love him. I'm not worried because this time it didn't come to pass. It all works together for good. See, that's your faith in God. I ain't mad because I pray, Lord, I need that money by tomorrow. They're going to cut my lights off. But tomorrow my lights go off. I'm not mad. I'm not frustrated. 
Because the same God, the same God who I prayed to before they went off, he's still God. And my faith is still in that same God. Y'all understand? But, but, but our, the problem is our faith is in our prayers, but not in God. And so things don't happen. And when they don't, and, and if they happen, we're happy. If they don't happen, we get frustrated because our faith is not in God. It isn't the results of our prayers. And so we walk around frustrated and disappointed. And our relationship with Jesus is frayed. Because we are praying to the unknown God. But tonight I declare Jesus unto you. That your faith must be in Jesus. A thought. Commitment to prayer or praying is not good enough. In many situations in life. People's first suggestion is, let's pray, which in and of itself is fine, but the commitment to praying is not indicative of your faith in God. Faith in praying proves frustrating because many are ambitious about praying, but not so much when it comes to the God who, prof who we profess we are praying to. So all the praying, it's time, child, it's prayer time. But what are you, who are you praying to? It's prayer time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, you're, not, you're saying Jesus, but you're not praying to Jesus. Because praying to him is communicating. That's communing with him. How can you pray to him, and then after you finish praying, you're frustrated? When you've been in the presence of Jesus, I've communed with Jesus. And because you got emotion, doesn't mean you were in the presence of Jesus. He abides on the inside. The Holy Ghost dwells on the inside. I speak to the one to whom I have given my life. And I know that all things work together for good for me because I love him and I'm the call according to his purpose. But our faith, our commitment is to prayer. It is to praying. But that's not going to do it. It's not going to do it. Your faith has to be in God. The only way it's going to work is your faith has to be in God. Y'all understand? Uh, in Titus 3 and 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou from constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And so we believe in God, and then we're careful about our works. We don't work to we don't work to prove our faith in God. We work we 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 work to please God because our faith is in God. And so we want our life, our living, to be consistent with the will of God. That's why when folks come to church, and you know we have our church. Uh, uh, service structure and I always talk about we have the altar call at the end of the service which is absolutely ridiculous if you come to the church and you are sick and you're sick and you wait for the, for the altar call time so you can get your prayer well you've not been taught faith in Jesus because I don't have to make an altar call for you to receive your healing mm -mm. I came in spite of being sick and if I leave still sick, my faith brought me here. So whether I'm healed or not doesn't matter. My faith is in the healer. So the reason I came and brought my illness with me, now don't bring your cooties with you. If it's, you know, if you got the cooties, you got the flu, stay at the house. Don't bring your cooties out, out the house. But if I if I come with my with my physical condition, I come because my faith is in Jesus. I got a headache, child. I'm staying home. I'm not staying at home. I'm taking this headache church with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to church by faith. And whether, whether he takes the headache away or not doesn't matter. I know I'm going to church. See? But it's ridiculous for me to come to I'm going to wait to the end of the service to get my prayer. And the whole time I sit up in the service and I'm sick. No. If any sick among you, let them call for the elder church. Then say call when the, when, the, when the order call comes and call for that. No. If you're sick, you call for the eldest of the church. Let them come and let them anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith that your sins might be forgiven. See, so we miss it so often because we have we have 
we have greater faith in the order of our service. We have, we're, we're impressed with what we do instead of being sensitive to the spirit of the Holy Ghost. When someone comes to the door is not feeling well, I need to be sensitive to that spirit and know it's time for the beginning to lay hands on you so you can receive your healing. So you can sit up in the service and worship Jesus and not sit here sick. But when we don't know, when we don't know and, 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 and we walk in ignorance, we're praying to the unknown God. All the stuff we're doing, but it's still to the unknown God. Because we put him on our daily ser service program. This is when we, he shows up. See, we, we give him a time to, for healing. We call it altar call. We give it time. You want to you wanna be saved? We have to wait for the altar call. I got to have an altar call before I can be saved. I have to have an altar call before I can receive some prayer. Right. Because this is the way we do it. Well, that's to the unknown God. To the unknown God. So now people's faith is in our structure of service. Ooh, child, I can't wait for the altar call. Ooh, I can't wait. I can't wait till they, they lay hands on me. Really? Who been teaching you? You're not going to sit under me and be taught that way. Not, I don't want to hear that coming in me. You know better than that. Our faith is in Jesus. Not in Pastor Gandy. If you're sick, you come in. You don't wait for an altar call. You come, you tell me, Pastor Gandy, I need prayer. If I don't discern it, you got to bring it to me. I need prayer. I don't feel well now. I ain't trying to go through the service not feeling well. I'm sick. I'm called on the elder of the church. I believe in prayer. Is that all right? And obeying the word of God. Now, when we do these things, when we find ourselves walking and pleasing God because our faith is in him, the problem is we become so bigoted and uppity in the church until we're more impressed and sadly we're more impressed in church with the preachers than we are with God. We have greater faith in the apostle, in the bishop, in the pastor, in the prophet, in the evangelist than we do in God. Now, again, faith in the gifts, but not in the gifter. So your faith in a man's gift does not prove anything. The question is, do you have faith in the gifter? His name is Jesus. Do you have faith in him? But I'm going to have to lay the fault in the rostrum, behind the pulpit, the college, because the people are taught by the preacher. The people are taught by the pastor. When you are mistaught, then you mislearn. So, when you're taught that you come and you reference me, instead of me teaching you firstly to reference Jesus, then you come in and your faith is in Pastor Gandhi and not in Jesus. And I'm more concerned that you give me the respect, the recognition, the honor, and the praise than in giving it to Jesus. So what happens is that you are always frustrated because your faith is founded in your pastor and not in Jesus. Now, that's my fault. Because I made myself important. Jesus talked about us preachers in his word. He talked about us in Mark chapter 12, verse 38, 39, and 40. He talked about us. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which, have, which, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces in our churches. And the chief seats in the synagogues in our churches. And the uppermost rooms at feasts in our churches. Which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And so their, their, uh, their intention is to impress. They make pretense. Because if I give a long prayer, ooh, y'all gonna say, ooh, pastor, he sure can pray. Well, you walked away impressed with my praying. But you didn't walk away impressed with the one we say we're praying to. And so now you're not receiving anything good of this because your faith is in my ability to pray. And you love the way that I pray. But you don't love the God we say we're praying to. Your faith is not in Jesus. It is in what you hear with your ears. And so we preachers, pastors have to be careful because we lead people astray by impressing people with our own personal worship, with our own personal church behaviors, than teaching people to have faith 
in Jesus Christ. When we get to the place where our faith is in Christ, we'll start walking with smiles on our faces. Not based on what's in your purse, what's in your bank account, what you drive, what you live in, but based on your relationship with Jesus. You know him for the parting of your sins. Faith in prayer, but not in God, will lead you to a place of confusion. It will keep you frustrated, disappointed. You will never be happily saved because you are a temperamental worshiper. And your, your, your faith in God will be contingent upon what you receive that you expect to receive. And when you don't get what you think you ought to have, then you have a problem with God. But you don't have faith in him. You, your faith will say, well, if he says no, then that's what I need to hear is a no, because he knows what's best for me, right? So we don't, we don't lament anything. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, faith and prayer, but not in God, will leave you frustrated. All right, let me stop right there and give God praise. It's not going to do it. Your faith has to be in God. The only way it's going to work is your faith has to be in God. Y'all understand? Uh, in Titus 3 and 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou firm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And so we believe in God, and then we're careful about our works. We don't work to, we don't work to prove our faith in God. We work, we, we, we work to please God because our faith is in God. And so we want our life, our living to be consistent with the will of God. That's why when folks come to church and, you know, we have our church uh, uh, service structure and I always talk about we have the altar call at the end of the service, which is absolutely ridiculous. If you come to the church and you are sick, and you're sick and you wait for the, for the altar call time so you can get your prayer. Well, you've not been taught faith in Jesus. Because I don't have to make an altar call for you to receive your healing. Mm -mm. I came in spite of being sick. And if I leave still sick, my faith brought me here. So whether I'm healed or not doesn't matter. My faith is in the healer. So the reason I came and brought my illness, now don't bring your cooties with you. If, it's, you know, if you got the cooties, you got the flu, stay at the house. Don't bring your cooties out, out the house. But if I, if I come with my, with my physical condition, I come because my faith is in Jesus. I got a headache, child. I'm staying at home. I'm not staying at home. I'm taking this headache church with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to church by faith. And whether, whether he takes the headache away or not, doesn't matter. I know I'm going to church. See? But it's ridiculous for me to come. Talk, I'm going to wait until the end of the service to get my prayer. And the whole time I sit up in the service and I'm sick. No. If any sick among you, let them call for the elder church. Then say call when the, when, the, when the order call comes and call for that. No, if you're sick, you call for the eldest of the church. Let them come and let them anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith that your sins might be forgiven. See? So we miss it so often because we have, we have, we have greater faith in the order of our service. We have, we're, we're impressed with what we do instead of being sensitive to the spirit of the Holy Ghost. When someone comes to the door and is not feeling well, I need to be sensitive to that spirit. And know it's time for the beginning to lay hands on you so you can receive your healing. So you can sit up in the service and worship Jesus and not sit here sick. But when we don't know, when we don't know, and, 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 and we walk in ignorance, we're praying to the unknown God. All the stuff we're doing, but it's still to the unknown God. Because we put him on our daily service program. This is when we, he shows up. See, we, we give him a time for healing. We call it altar call. We give it time. You want to you wanna be saved? We have to wait for the altar call. I got to have an altar call before I can be saved. I have to have an altar call before I can receive some prayer. 
Right. Because this is the way we do it. Well, that's to the unknown God. To the unknown God. So now people's faith is in our structure of service. Ooh, child, I can't wait for the altar call. Ooh, I can't wait. I can't wait till they, they lay hands on me. Really? Who's been teaching you? Now I'm going to sit under me and be taught that way. Now, look, I don't want to hear that coming in me. You know better than that. Our faith is in Jesus, not in Pastor Gandy. If you're sick, you come in. You don't wait for an altar call. You come, you tell me, Pastor Gandy, I need prayer. If I don't discern it, you got to bring it to me. I need prayer. I don't feel well now. I ain't trying to go through the service not feeling well. I'm sick. I'm called on the elder church. I believe in prayer. Is that all right? And obeying the word of God. Now, when we do these things, then we find ourselves walking and pleasing God because our faith is in him. The problem is we become so bigoted and uppity in the church until we're more impressed and sadly, we're more impressed in church with the preachers than we are with God. We have greater faith in the apostle, in the bishop, in the pastor, in the prophet, in the evangelist, than we do in God. Now, again, faith in the gifts, but not in the gifter. So your faith in a man's gift does not prove anything. The question is, do you have faith in the gifter? His name is Jesus. Do you have faith in him? But I'm going to have to lay the fault in the rostrum, behind the pulpit, the college, because the people are taught by the preacher. The people are taught by the pastor. When you are mistaught, then you mislearn. So when you're taught that you come and you reference me, instead of me teaching you firstly to reference Jesus, then you come in and your faith is in Pastor Gandhi and not in Jesus. And I'm more concerned that you give me the respect, the recognition, the honor, and the praise than in giving it to Jesus. So what happens is that you are always frustrated because your faith is founded in your pastor and not in Jesus. Now, that's my fault because I made myself important. Jesus talked about us preachers in his word. He talked about us in Mark chapter 12, verse 38, 39, and 40. He talked about us. And he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which, have, which, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces in our churches and the chief seats in the synagogues in our churches and uppermost rooms at feasts in our churches which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. And so their, their, uh, their intention is to impress. They make pretense because if I give a long prayer, ooh, y'all gonna say, ooh, pastor, he sure can pray. Well, you walked away impressed with my praying, but you didn't walk away impressed with the one we say we're praying to. And so now you're not receiving anything good of this, because your faith is in my ability to pray. And you love the way that I pray. But you don't love the God we say we're praying to. Your faith is not in Jesus. It is in what you hear with your ears. And so we preachers, pastors have to be careful. Because we lead people astray by impressing people with our own personal worship. With our own personal church behaviors. Than teaching people to have faith in Jesus Christ. When we get to the place where our faith is in Christ, we'll start walking with smiles on our faces. Not based on what's in your purse, what's in your bank account, what you drive, what you live in, but based on your relationship with Jesus. You know him for the parting of your sins. Faith in prayer but not in God will lead you to a place of confusion. It will keep you frustrated, disappointed. You will never be happily saved because you are a temperamental worshiper. And your, your, your faith in God will be contingent upon what you receive that you expect to receive. 
And when you don't get what you think you ought to have, then you have a problem with God. But you don't have faith in him. You, your faith will say, well, if he says no, then that's what I need to hear is a no, because he knows what's best for me, right? So we don't, we don't lament anything. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, faith and prayer, but not in God, will leave you frustrated. All right, let me stop right there. Give God praise. It's not going to do it. Your faith has to be in God. The only way it's going to work is your faith has to be in God. Y'all understand? Uh, in Titus 3 and 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou firm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And so we believe in God. And then we're careful about our works. We don't work to we don't work to prove our faith in God. We work we 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 work to please God because our faith is in God. And so we want our life our living to be consistent with the will of God. That's why when folks come to church, and you know we have our church uh, uh, service structure. And I always talk about we have the altar call at the end of the service, which is absolutely ridiculous. If you come to the church and you are sick, and you're sick and you wait for the, for the altar call time so you can get your prayer, well, you've not been taught faith in Jesus. Because I don't have to make an altar call for you to receive your healing. Mm -mm. I came in spite of being sick. And if I leave still sick, my faith brought me here. So whether I'm healed or not doesn't matter. My faith is in the healer. So our reason I came and brought my illness with me, now don't bring your cooties with you. If it's, you know, if you got the cooties, you got the flu, stay at the house. Don't bring your cooties out of the house. But if I if I come with my with my physical condition, I come because my faith is in Jesus. I got a headache, child. I'm staying home. I'm not staying at home. I'm taking this headache church with me. I'm 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 going to church by faith. And whether whether he takes the headache away or not. Doesn't matter. I know I'm going to church. See? But it's ridiculous for me to come. Talk, I'm going to wait to the end of the service to get my prayer. And the whole time I sit up in the service and I'm sick. No. If any sick among you, let them call for an elder to church. Then say call when the, when, the, when the altar call comes and call for that. No. If you're sick, you call for the eldest of the church. Let them come and let them anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith that your sins might be forgiven. See? So we miss it so often because we have we have... We have greater faith in the order of our service. We have, we're, we're impressed with what we do instead of being sensitive to the spirit of the Holy Ghost. When someone comes to the door and not feeling well, I need to be sensitive to that spirit and know it's time for the beginning to lay hands on you so you can receive your healing. So you can sit up in the service and worship Jesus and not sit here sick. But when we don't know, when we don't know and, 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 and we walk in ignorance, we're praying to the unknown God. All the stuff we're doing, but it's still to the unknown God. Because we put him on our daily service program. This is when we he shows up. See, we, we give him a time for healing. We call it altar call. We give it time. You want to you wanna be saved? We have to wait for the altar call. I got an altar call for how to be saved. I have an altar call before I can receive some prayer. Right. Because this is the way we do it. Well, that's to the unknown God. To the unknown God. So now people's faith is in our structure of service. Ooh, child, I can't wait for the altar call. Ooh, I can't wait. I can't wait till they, hand, they lay hands on me. Really? Who's been teaching you? You're not going to sit under me and be taught that way. Not, I don't want to hear that coming to me. You know better than that. Our faith is in Jesus. Not in Pastor Gandy. If you're sick, you come in. You don't wait for an altar call. You come and tell me, Pastor Gandy, I need prayer. If I don't discern it, you got to bring it to me. I need prayer. I don't feel well now. I ain't trying to go through the service not feeling well. I'm sick. I'm called on the elder church. I believe in prayer. Is that all right? And obeying the word of God. Now, when we do these things, then we find ourselves walking 
in pleasing God because our faith is in him. The problem is we become so bigoty and uppity in the church until we're, we're more impressed, and sadly, we're more impressed in church with the preachers than we are with God. We have greater faith in the apostle, in the bishop, in the pastor, in the prophet, in the evangelist than we do in God. Now, again, faith in the gifts, but not in the gifter. So your faith in a man's gift does not prove anything. The question is, do you have faith in the gifter? His name is Jesus. Do you have faith in him? But I'm going to have to lay the fault in the rostrum, behind the pulpit, the college, because the people are taught by the preacher. The people are taught by the pastor. When you are mistaught, then you mislearn. So when you're taught that you come and you reference me, instead of me teaching you firstly to reference Jesus, then you come in and your faith is in Pastor Gandhi and not in Jesus. And I'm more concerned that you give me the respect, the recognition, the honor, and the praise than in giving it to Jesus. So what happens is that you are always frustrated because your faith is founded in your pastor and not in Jesus. Now, that's my fault because I made myself important. Jesus talked about us preachers in his word. He talked about us in Mark chapter 12, verse 38, 39, and 40. He talked about us. And he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which have, which which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces in our churches and the cheap seats in the synagogues in our churches and uppermost rooms at feasts in our churches, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And so their, their, uh, their intention is to impress they make pretense because if I give a long prayer, ooh, y'all gonna say, ooh, Pastor, he sure can pray. Well, you walked away impressed with my praying, but you didn't walk away impressed with the one we say we're praying to. And so now you're not receiving anything good of this because your faith is in my ability to pray. And you love the way that I pray, but you don't love the God we say we're praying to. Your faith is not in Jesus. It is in what you hear with your ears. And so we preachers, pastors have to be careful because we lead people astray by impressing people with our own personal worship, with our own personal church behaviors than teaching people to have faith in Jesus Christ. When we get to the place where our faith is in Christ, We'll start walking with smiles on our faces. Not based on what's in your purse, what's in your bank account, what you drive, what you live in, but based on your relationship with Jesus. You know him for the parting of your sins. Faith and prayer, but not in God, will lead you to a place of confusion. It will keep you frustrated, disappointed. You will never be happily saved because you are a temperamental worshiper and your, your, your faith in God will be contingent upon what you receive that you expect to receive and when you don't get what you think you ought to have then you have a problem with God but you don't have faith in him you, your faith will say well if he says no then that's what I need to hear is a no because he knows what's best for Right? So we don't we don't lament anything. In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, faith and prayer, but not in God, will leave you frustrated. All right, let me stop right there and give God praise. Oh, God bless you, people of God, amen. Thank God for you this. My baby son, Joshua, here. We just want to give God praise for you viewing the video. 
And we hope you receive what God was imparting to you in this uh, video and this message. And we look forward to seeing your face at 2516 Halls Mill Road, Mobile, Alabama, 36606. Now listen, if you need to call Pastor again, just give me a call, 251-591-6679. You can email me at pastor at twocornerstone.org, pastor at twocornerstone.org. We thank you again, and the blessing of God be upon you in Jesus' name.